My name is uh, Peter Wanzi. Welcome to the Unpaved Path Talk, and I'm your host. Today, we are going to be talking about uh, international students. We are going to be talking about the journey of international students in the United States, uh, what it takes to be an international student, what is the journey like, how do you integrate the society at large after completion of your studies, and what exactly does it take? How do you choose a program? What is life like, like an international student? What are the challenges that you experience as an international student? What are the stats? What's the university you need to pick if you're aspiring to be an international student? How do you orientate your choices? What are the uh, ramifications of getting a program and how that plays out in the long term of your life and your stay in the United States? So it's like an amazing, amazing episode we're going to have here today. I'm quite excited about it because today I'm going to be talking with Danny. Uh, He's he's uh, an international student or was an international student. So we're going to get in the truth from the horse mouth and we're going to be we're putting that information to you out there so you can be able, if you're helping someone, if you know someone who is interested in coming to the United States as an international student, what are some of the things they need to be looking at? What are some of the stats they need to be looking at? What are some of the universities? What are some of the towns? What are some of the cities? What are some of the programs? Um, and that's what we'll be talking about today. And as I said, I'm very excited about it. So I'll say you stick right in, right to the end of this program. And let's get going. Hey, Daniel, welcome. Thank you, Peter. How are you doing? Good, good, good. Uh, first time on the podcast? Yeah, very, very first time, you know. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> thank you, man. Thank you, yeah. for, thank you for accepting our, our invitation. And thank you for for helping in building uh, this community we're trying to build here uh, and putting your own solid stone on the edifice that we're trying to build. You, um, who is, who, who is, uh, who is uh, Danny? Who is, uh, how do we, how do our viewers know you? Well, Danny is a lifetime technology enthusiast. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a software engineer. Mm -hmm. I am a part-time entrepreneur and I am a lifelong learner. So. Mm -hmm. Anything that has to do with technology, um, entrepreneurship, it's what I'm really passionate about. Mm -hmm. And I love learning. I love sharing my knowledge with other people. So, yeah. That's that. That's great. Because we're going to be talking about uh, your your journey as, as, as an international student. Which, uh, to start, where do you, where, how did that occur to you? When, at what point did you say, did, did you say I was going to, uh, leave my home country and go to the United States. What kind of motivates you to make that choice and and make the move? Well, that's a good question. Um, I think this was back in 2016, mm -hmm. and um, you know that was if if you recall in Southern Cameroon we mm -hmm. had this uprising among university students, mm -hmm. and I was just and that's in Cameroon, right? That's in Cameroon, okay. yeah. And you know I started talking to my brother at that time. He was in Minnesota uh, mm -hmm. in the USA. And, uh, you know, I asked him, I'm like, I want to, you know, I want to travel out. I want to come to the United States. I want to continue my studies. Like, how do I go about that? And he just, all he did was like, go on Google. That's, oh, that was the first. That's, that's all he told me. Mm -hmm. So I went on Google and started doing a lot of research about international studies in the United States. Uh, I searched for schools in uh, Minnesota because that was where my brother lived at the time. So it was very easy mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. narrow down mm -hmm. my search. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's we have a lot of state colleges and community colleges in Minnesota. So it, was, it wasn't it was an easy search. So I had to narrow down my uh, search criteria. Mm -hmm. So I'll say, okay, which of these universities offer the program that I want to study? How much does it cost mm -hmm. um, to attend a university? And is it going to be something that I can afford or that mm -hmm. my family can be able to support me yeah, sure. throughout this journey? So that was how I was able to narrow down my search to uh, Bemidji State University where I attended my education. What's your, uh, what you're saying is nothing extraordinary happened. You just went to Google. That's the first process. You just yeah. went to Google, search uh, what universities are out there. Uh, what program can I enlist on and what university? Like, so you're narrowing your choices based on what factor is principal. Is it like the price? Is it like the, uh, the, uh, program you want to study or how do you, uh, get that, uh, specific, uh, university you want, you want to go to? Yeah. Um, I think like you, first of all, have 
to fully understand where you want to be at in life. Okay, so that's you, the first thing. Yeah, you need to, if you're picking up a major to study in the university, you have to be absolutely sure you this is what you want to do. Mm -hmm. Because as an international student, um, it costs a lot to attend school in the United States. So the last thing you want to do is um, go into a program where you're not sure about it and waste money and have to switch the major at some point. So you have to be absolutely sure of the path you're going on. So the path you picked, was it influenced by what you were doing before or you uh, had to do a research on what are the best fields to get in, in the United States before you made the choice or started like really filtering your, your program? Yeah, that's a good question. I think I think your guests and, and your listeners are going to benefit from this. So when I chose to study in the United States, I was thinking I was going to study law. Oh, really? Yeah, I wanted to study <laughs> law. And that's that's how naive I was. And my brother told me, hey, you know, you do realize like in the United States has a completely different legal system mm -hmm. um, to Cameroon. So like, say, for example, if you were you were to be done with your studies here mm -hmm. and you can't you can't use that back home if you were to practice law so make sure you are going to something that can set you up in life where no matter where you find yourself you can also earn a living for mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and he sort of like nudged me towards uh the tech side of things and at that time i was i was very into very much into technology so i would uh i, I would stay on up to date with the latest like uh, tech news from like latest releases of iphone gadgets to computers and stuff like that so i was very immersed in technology so i said well um, I love computers, so mm -hmm. I'm going to try my hand in the computer science field. So that's, but you, you were studying law before? Yeah, I was studying law before. Oh, that's amazing. Like, you're the second person who has uh, been on this, on this podcast yeah. from Cameroon who, on coming to the United States, thought they were going to study law. Like, I have <laughs> I have an episode, guys, with uh, with Blanche and Adesh, uh, the entrepreneurs, the uh, the deco business. If you want to check the video, you can do that. Like right down uh, uh, on this channel, you can f find that video. The same thing, kind of experience. We talk. She she made mention of the fact that she wanted to study law as well <laughs> before she traveled. But when she got there, she understood like uh, that's no that's not going to happen yeah. because of probably <laughs> the different legal system and and probably the time is going to take for you to be able to get a law degree and actually like. Practice, yeah, yeah. Oh, so you picked uh, uh, IT, yeah. And how was how was how was your experience uh, in um, getting into a new field? Probably Cameroon is not very technologically savvy in the sense of very intense as far as the program. I can, I'm that can be a very very uh, a, a, a biased point of view because I, I'm generally I'm. Principal not in the field, so I should uh, probably take that back. Mm -hmm. I, I, I want what I'm like trying to say is, um, how did you immerse yourself in the field? Probably law is completely different from from IT. You're a software engineer. Uh, I believe that's a lot of coding and stuff like that. How did you switch your brain to start digesting that kind of information? Well, in the beginning, I kept on telling myself, "This is gonna be hard. This is gonna be hard." Mm -hmm. Like I had. A very much a negative mindset going into it. Okay, right? I, I knew I was just going to suffer. Uh oh, um, but when I started the program, I I didn't take any computer science classes. Actually, I started with math classes. Oh, math. Yeah, I, so I started taking math classes, mm -hmm. and it was very challenging for me because like I, I didn't like math uh, when I was in high school or in the university back home. I I was not good at math, mm -hmm. so it's sort of like put me in a position where I could challenge myself, really. Mm -hmm. I'm like, what is so difficult about math that I cannot comprehend? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I like to think like I'm a smart guy. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and and I did leverage a lot of the resources that was available uh, on campus at that time. We okay. had like math tutors. Um, I went to my professor's office hours a lot. Mm -hmm. And that really helped me comprehend math. And I just got a good grasp at math. And then I just went on from there. Okay. And subsequently, I started taking, like, in my second year of college, I started taking more of the core computer science classes, like data structures and algorithms, mm -hmm. um, um, like uh, computer science, mm -hmm. core computer science mm -hmm. uh, one and two. So that taking those classes and having, like, a strong foundation in the math classes definitely did help me in solving, like, some of the complex problems uh, that you have to solve, solve as an engineer and in the computer science field. So it was a complete switch. You had, like, tell your brain that i'm going yes. to we're getting to this like zero yeah and we're going to 
learn it the right way. We're going to start from the basics and really build up from there and, 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 and just keep excelling, which is uh, very interesting because I wanted to ask if you weren't influenced in any way by the, uh, the like crash programs out there, mm -hmm. uh, the very short IT courses that have come across on the internet and, and, and from referrals that uh, friends have spoken to me about. Like you can be a software engineer in six months or uh, why do you need to go to college to go struggle, get in, in debt and to, 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 <laughs> to get a, a degree when you can just do some crash course somewhere and, and be able to understand exactly what the uh, the whole things are. What's your take? What's your take on that particular point? Uh, that's a that's a really good question because for me going to the computer science field, I had, I didn't have that at that time. There wasn't like the um, uh, the increase in like several boot camps and and, and all these like crash programs. It, in twenty sixteen, there wasn't a lot of them, and 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 at that time, I I, I had no idea of it. Mm -hmm. But what I did uh get. Yeah, a lot from from my brother's friends and like from people that I knew once I moved to the US is they kept on telling me, Well, you are studying computer science. Like if you don't have any certifications, you need to take certifications. Uh -huh. Because without certifications in this country, you yeah. cannot uh get a good job. Mm -hmm. uh, you're just wasting your time in the computer science field. So I, I heard that a lot. And being someone where like half going into a program, you're already like already discouraged um, thinking it's going to be hard and then like people are telling you oh you know you need to do this so mm -hmm. um that was the only influence i had so it made me second guess like well why don't i just quit school go get the certifications and try my hand and get my job but deep down in me i i, I just felt like this was the right path that mm -hmm. i was on i felt like i need to shape my own path and cancel out the noise so i just stuck with the program but with uh boot camps these days and like crash course programs right you can have a general knowledge of software development and uh, uh, web development mm -hmm. in three or six months. You mm -hmm. can have a basic understanding. You can probably even work somewhere. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> the 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 issue is like, think about it. Mm -hmm. You're taking six months to become a software engineer where there are people who it takes a lot longer than that to finish a college program. Four years, right? Yeah, sure. And then... When you go into the field, your first one year, two years, you are learning. Mm -hmm. So whatever you've been taught in the bootcamp, it's just like, hey, basic understanding of software design, software development. The actual learning takes place at your job because that is where you face real life world problems that affects an organization. And you learn how to debug, how to troubleshoot, how to think about a problem how to go about solving it. And in as much as like you can take a crash course program and you have you have to dedicate extra hours outside of work to find your craft. Because mm -hmm. even me, I went to a four-year college program and after work, I have to spend an hour or 30 minutes here to learn a new language or sharpen my skill at another language. So it's a lifelong relearning process. Mm -hmm. So you cannot go for six months and say, well, I'm a software engineer or I'm a web developer. <laughs> no, you have to continue putting in that hours outside of work to refine your craft. So you're, you're, if you were to pick a, between a crash program and the... Uh, so you're saying it's totally worth it to go to college and learn the craft as it's supposed to be done uh so or oh, 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 so, you're oh it's oh it's a oh it's a personal thing it's like if you if you think you can adapt in the six months and be good at it fine yeah if if you're not i would advise that you take the regular path like just take your time go begin the program and go slowly first of all um with college if you have the opportunity to go i think like the experience is something you would never get anywhere else yeah let's talk so, about like, that yeah, the experience is amazing. I think like if you have the opportunity to go, you go. And uh, I mean, guaranteed, not everyone has that opportunity to go to a four-year college sure. program. Yeah. So if you're having to try your hand at a crash course program, I believe like you, the expectation, you should, you should set yourself a realistic expectation that like you are not going to be an expert in six months. You are going to learn the basics, you know, and which, which any study program that you're on, whether that's like college or crash course, it's meant to, uh, spark an interest in you yeah. for you to go and deep dive and learn on your own and 
and discover stuff on your own. So like if you do a, a crash course program, you need to spend hours outside mm-hmm. of that program. Even when you have a job, you need to spend hours like practicing, learning. Because like the field of uh, software engineering and technology is constantly changing, mm-hmm. right? Like you might know a particular language, but there are new updates to that language that like use different syntax and like things like uh, they said in like, uh, uh, methods or variable names mm-hmm. that become depreciated. So like you have to always be on top of, top of those things. So like it's a constant learning process. Mm-hmm. Like you have to have your own side projects that you're working on and those side projects help refine your skills. So my point is if you're going to go to a six, a six months crash program, the expectation should be that you are not going to be an expert software engineer. In six, six months. months. <laughs> what, uh, the, uh, my experience, uh, oh, sorry, your experience on campus uh, I wanted to bring out like some 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 funny stats here. Not not really funny, but um, this is starts from the uh, Institute of International Education. The uh, number of international students in the United States it's it's a lot. Like the uh, the uh, um, it, it kind of varies every year. Uh, but we are talking about the, in 2016, 2017, there were like over a million international students. And um, in a, like 2003, 2004, it was like 572,000. And the numbers have just been like growing and growing and growing from there uh, to 700,000 to 800. And by the time we're in uh, 2017, 2018, you are looking at almost uh, 1.1 million international students. And um, the uh, countries that are producing like the highest number of international students so far, we have like first China, second India, third South Korea, fourth Canada, Saudi Arabia, Vietnam, Taiwan, Brazil, Mexico, and then we have Nigeria. Nigeria is like number ten on this on the uh, most updated uh, list uh, from the uh, Institute of International Students on the uh, uh, country and the uh, number of international students that these countries kind of kind of produce and. Nigeria is actually the only African country in the top 15 um, that have the highest number of, of, of international students. Not, and it's the the only African country on this on this uh, on this stat. Mm-hmm. Do you know um, in your experience on campus and talking with other international students? Do you know uh, why or what could be influencing the fact that uh, Africans are uh, have like a less population as far as from an international student demographic kind of uh, uh, viewpoint. Mm-hmm. Why they uh, they are like least represented in uh, in universities in the United States. That's a that's a good question because from my experience, uh, yeah, at Bemidji State, mm-hmm. we had quite a good uh, uh, diverse background because we had. I remember we had like somewhere of uh 10 uh international students from africa okay ten. we yeah we had uh, uh quite a couple from nepal from brazil and a, a handful from china so I, I think from my experience in the school we had we had quite a large number of african international students to my surprise it was like bemidji is four hours north of here like close to the border of canada so that's that, that's a place you would least expect to find African Africa. international students mm-hmm. go to, but um, there was a good balance of uh, students from Africa. I don't know about other colleges, but that was what my experience was. Um, so that's your that's the experience at the uh, at Bemidji. So it, because from the uh, from the stats that we're looking at, it looks like uh, Africans have like a really very very small very very small uh, uh, rep- from country from country from country perspective. Yeah. I mean Nigeria is like top in the chart there with like about 14,000 uh, international students. Um, but the, uh, as a whole, as a whole, the uh, African, Africans are like not really, really I, I was thinking maybe it's something, the sense of like finances, so the uh, sense of uh, people are not, um, not very aware of how open the United States is to uh, welcoming international students because international students actually create jobs. I, uh, jobs in the united states so it's something that they are open like prone to, to yeah. doing that so how can we like push that uh uh i don't want to say mentality but how can we have an extra push and have students kind of really 
coming year who will have the potential of actually really excelling in different fields. Yeah, I think I think uh like uh economic factors does play a part. Uh, and uh, I also think like lack of awareness is also a huge problem. And the reason I say this is uh, most people, uh, especially from Cameroon, they do believe like for you to uh, start the process of uh, getting years as an international student, it incurs a lot of upfront costs. Like you have to spend a lot of money. Yeah, let's talk about that yeah. a little bit more. Yeah. So from my experience, uh, once it, it's, it's not that co- it's, it, the, the cost uh, at the beginning is not hefty. Mm-hmm. My experience is once I figured out the institution I wanted to attend, I I went on the, the, the website, I applied, and uh, I waited for a couple of days. I was in constant communication with the school. I would email them about my application process, and I, I had the ability to track it online. And once I received my admission letter, it was, at that point, I only spent $20. Oh. That's before before, I, before be, the whole process from applying to get an admission letter. I only spent twenty dollars. <laughs> that's so, wait, wait, I, I don't want to cut you there, but yeah. uh, that's a very very important point you're making because I've heard so many people uh, fall into like scams yeah. uh, of people getting in between the way of uh, of students trying to figure out how to get uh, admitted into universities in the United States. And they usually have to, at times have to pass through third parties, mm-hmm. maybe through some kind of family relatives, maybe through some other person who is uh, talking to them on their behalf and being like, "Yeah, we are, we we can get you admitted in the university." You, what you are saying is, no, you can actually just go straight to the university, start getting contact directly with the people. You don't need any other person around this. You just exactly. you can you can do it by yourself, right? Exactly. It's and it's it's way way straightforward, so easy. Mm-hmm. Right, like it's like when you go to third parties, they're not doing anything special. They're doing the same. They're following the same instructions that's available on the school's website. So mm-hmm. all they're doing is just like go on the website. They follow the, the instructions. Like, oh, what do you need for admission? Well, you need your transcript, right? <laughs> you need to fill out this application mm-hmm. form. You need to write an essay stating mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. why you want to study at this university. Mm-hmm. So it's pretty standard. So they just go and do that work for you, and then they charge you a lot of money for it, mm-hmm. right? So at that point, I only spent twenty dollars because that was the application fee I had to pay. And I had an admission letter in my hand. And from there on, it was about, I had to like go on the U.S. Embassy website, schedule an appointment. Um, and then uh, there's a list of documents you need to bring, like your proof of income, um, um, your proof of income birth certificate, your application forms, your, your uh, um, um, what is that? I think like your passport. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, just and, regular. Yeah, it was regular just. Regular just, documents. Yeah, regular documents. Like why, is it, why, why is it so hard? Why do you think it's so hard for, uh, which is why I really appreciate like everyone who comes to this podcast. The, uh, we're trying to like deal with common awareness, like some kind of, um, uh, throwing that information out. It's like, it's yeah. not magic. This is exactly what it takes to do what I'm doing. Or this is exactly what it took me to do what I'm doing. We're trying to be as transparent as we can just to like help other people. Uh, so they don't maybe don't fall into traps or don't get scammed or things like that. What you're saying is it's very simple. You have the documents, you go to the embassy. If you uh find that you fill all the the the, 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 the check all the boxes that needs to be checked, you're good. You're good to go. You get your thing and then you're 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 off for your studies. Um so I really do appreciate I really do appreciate that that perspective. What what let's 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 cut a little bit uh, from from I know we've been talking like very intense stuff here, but let's talk a little bit more about your experience on campus or yeah. your experience as an international student on campus. Yeah, what was it like? Did you have like language barriers? Like I've spoken with uh, some international students who said like the very first week in class, they no one was getting what they were saying because they like they have like an accent, quote unquote. That's very strong, so the uh, yeah. professor is able to understand what they what they say. I've actually I've actually heard of international students who have used that to their advantage, though. Like, oh, they're in class, and then <laughs> they they get their props graded because uh, they are not like getting what they're saying. So they just believe that maybe what he's saying is like smart or not, but like yeah. just really what what was the experience uh like with uh, your, like your first week on 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 on, on campus? Um, what, what was that like? My first week on campus, uh, there's, there's, I wouldn't say it was there was a language barrier. I think there was like, uh, there was like the the issue where like you have an accent, mm-hmm. and uh, 
a lot of the times, like my, from my experience, like people would ask you to repeat stuff quite a lot. Like, oh, sorry, what did you say? Mm-hmm. And it's just because like you're asking and like they're having a, a hard time understanding you. But um, I I didn't have that with the professors. Like I felt like I could communicate well and the professors could understand me. Mm-hmm. And usually you would find that like schools that have like um, uh, an inv- like they have like a good international student body or like oh, yeah. you yeah. international students present. You would understand like the professors uh, have had like, some 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 form of experience mm-hmm. with international students mm-hmm. in the class, and they know how to navigate mm-hmm. uh, these barriers. And um, I, I would say like some of the students from China and Brazil, they they had they, they had more of a difficult mm-hmm. time, um, mm-hmm. and than than me for uh, I I can I know that for sure. But yeah, it's it's uh, I think like yeah, you would you would you would definitely have I had you definitely have some issues on it, and it's some professors because like. There are some professors that are, you know, they they are they asking like they're from all over the country. Like mm-hmm. so, like we had uh, a professor that was from the, from the south, and the asking from the south is quite mm-hmm. different from uh, the asking in the mm-hmm. Midwest. Mm-hmm. So uh, you would always you, you always often hear like this uh, interest in asking and like oh you were like oh sorry like what did you say you know <laughs> so it's it's something that goes both ways like it takes you a while to get used to it. The, uh, year in that asset and then like it takes a while for other people to start like understanding like oh okay this is what you're saying what you're saying yeah so that was my experience but i didn't have a language barrier uh, but i do know like it's it's something that like people have to navigate uh a lot of a lot. times like yeah. people have to navigate that not a language barrier what about the extra extra curricular activities i i uh I've heard, I mean, I've watched on, on, on movies, yeah. uh, seen students who get scholarships, for instance, by being very good at sports or specific, uh, uh, I don't know, swimming, tennis or, yeah. or whatever. Um, did you, did you get involved in, in some of those kind of activities and how did that like translate into, uh, how your studies went? Um, it, I, I did, I did actually, uh, we had a, a, a soccer club. Oh, okay. And and uh, I joined that in my first year. And mm-hmm. what we do is like it's a, it's a, an intramural mm-hmm. soccer club. So like we would go and play all the universities mm-hmm. in intramural tournaments. Mm-hmm. And I, I remember one tournament we went up to Duluth and we played uh, against other universities. So that was that was fun. And then the second year I became the president of that club. So I would help organize uh, sporting activities. So uh, that definitely opens up a lot of room for you to meet other international students, other students, because you all are part of like. This club and it was both uh it was both like a, a male and female sort of thing so like it was gender inclusive mm-hmm. so you 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 had the opportunity to meet uh, a lot of people through this program but uh, the interesting about uh live on campus because my first year I I lived in the dorms oh oh you were like yeah. like right in the dorms <laughs> yeah so my first my uh-huh. first semester I lived in the dorms mm-hmm. so we had uh it, we had both male and female living in the dorms oh so but we, not in the same rooms but no, like not, in the, yeah, uh, but, yeah. the like you can meet the, yeah, a female yeah. on the corridor yeah. yeah and we had like on the hallway one, yeah we had like one kitchen for each floor because <laughs> like three floors and <laughs> one kitchen on each floor <laughs> and it was so interesting because like you if you have to make a meal for yourself you, you have, have to, to go to the line like <laughs> so, how, how was that like uh you you didn't experience that in camera I, I, I didn't even ask uh that 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 question at the start of the yeah. show but you had a degree already in Cameroon before, before, before traveling, or uh, this is like where you got like your first. Your I, first. I I had not completed my degree when I because for me I was I was like you know for me going to this whole process uh, uh, of applying and coming here, it was something I was I was I was trying my hand at like it, deep down in me I wasn't like oh this is like my it, yeah, this I'm gonna put all my focus in here and if it doesn't work then I'm screwed. I was more of like, okay, you know, I have my education back here, mm-hmm. but if this works out, it will be great for me to go. Mm-hmm. So when it worked out, I'm like, okay, I cannot stay here and like completely to have to make a choice mm-hmm. right now. So I'm like, oh no, I, I wouldn't pass on that choice. It's, it, it felt like an opportunity of a lifetime for me. So I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So so you had to learn how to live in uh, in that kind of setting with like the, yeah. So I had to like relearn how to, uh, not not relearn, but like, I I had no experience like living <laughs> yeah, in that living kind of, dorm, like living that kind of dorms, you know. But <laughs> it was interesting because um, you do get to meet a lot of people, mm-hmm. you know, like uh, on the floor that you're in, like you become friends with like everyone on your floor, mm-hmm. and like you have nights where like everyone make food and you guys all hang out in the lobby of uh, of the dorm mm-hmm. and you guys play mm-hmm. games and like chat till like two a.m. and like it's it's a fun experience, like. 
that experience was really really amazing for me. Yeah. So it's something you wouldn't trade for. for no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Trade for. <laughs> it was. It was. It was good. It yeah, was a good experience. It was. A good, yeah. Good. I, I can. I can like believe. Uh, how 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 fun uh, an experience like for an international student can can definitely be, especially if the uh, setting you are in is very inclusive. Yeah. And most universities usually have like um. I don't want to say department, but they have um, some kind of office that takes care of, of international students where if you have any issues, you can like, go to them mm-hmm. for, for more clarity. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. We we actually also have uh, uh, had an international student body. Okay. So, so like, um, all international students uh, uh, had the option to be part of that body. And what we did was we offered support to other international students. So... Um, you would often find like a group of like five or six international students mm-hmm. all renting uh, one house one. And, mm-hmm. and, 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 and shared splitting the bills. Mm-hmm. And like people, we all knew like it, we are in a different line. So like we all uh, went, you know, we, if we have one of our members who's mm-hmm. sick or yeah, unable yeah, on, yeah. on yeah. to in class who, who you know, uh, put, your hands together. put your hands together and try to help them out, uh, uh, get up to speed. Like mm-hmm. you had people in that group who were very good at setting subjects or like uh, at setting courses, but like if you were struggling, it was easy to like meet them and like get help. So it, it was like a very good community that we had. Like we meet on the weekends and have a, have a beer or two and chat and like, you know, get to learn uh, about each other's experiences mm-hmm. and, and, and their cultures and where they're from. So it, it was, it was, it was a great, I would recommend like if you're, if you're a, you find yourself on any campus as an international student, definitely um, join the international student body. Like, there's a lot of benefits to that. Okay. Yeah. The, uh, the switching gears back to uh, to uh, thing that's now you 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 think that's like yeah that's you can like tell it also because um, the uh, when when looking at the uh, the stats in the uh, in the in the United States for I, I was just looking at the. Um, census the u.s census bureau for 2018 and looking at the stats and um i realized like the median u.s household income by any group Mm -hmm. in the united states the first guys who are like topping that chart they are indians then they are like taiwanese they're like chinese so indian americans are on medium uh median like 119 thousand that's like six figures uh the next ethnic group that 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 follows is the, like taiwanese the, the chinese the, the japanese the pakistani the filipino indonesian korean cambodian the Hmong, the vietnamese and then the white americans uh the americans are um, the income of like seventy five thousand nine hundred two. that's the start of 2018 so it means uh indians indians uh the indians are making over fifty five thousand dollars more income than even Americans. And when I was looking uh some of the uh, of the stats and why that is, I realized that they have like very meticulous in like the programs that they send their kids, like what what the students go to school, what they study and stuff like that. Yeah. And I realized that the like thirty six percent of of Indian students, for instance, study engineering. Mm-hmm. Uh. 35% study math and computer science. Uh, 6% are like the physical life science, 4% are in other fields, and 1% humanities, 1% intensive English, health professional 3%, uh, fine applied arts 2%, education 1%. And when, when I look at this chart, I see that they are into STEM programs. And STEM program, and you're, you're a software engineer, so you're definitely in started you definitely in uh in one of these programs that they are in yeah uh that they send their kids into and that they want that they orientate like the kind of education they want their kids to do did that translate into your you you done with studies yes i am and you you um probably working now and you 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 have a good job or whatever yeah what how does that translate is it is it um how you advise someone who wants to get into a program? Like from 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 what I'm seeing here from the stats and what they are investing in, I would say STEM programs are like I mean, if you want to make money, because you 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 started a program sometime by saying if you want to uh, you want to make sure that you pick the right program, yes. you don't want to change the course in the. Uh, sometime later during yeah. the years during your program and from what i'm seeing i'm looking at the top earners and the top earners in the united states from what i'm seeing here they're indians and 
the uh, programs they are studying, they are STEM programs. Mm -hmm. So, and which is one of the programs you're studying, which is a, a software engineering force under that same category. Yeah. Will you say that is like what you should do if you're an international student or if you're like looking, uh, you're going to say like just follow your passion? Um, I, I think like STEM programs are the safe, because education is an investment in yourself. So I think STEM programs are the best investment one of the best investments that you can make uh, as an international student uh, on yourself. Because from my experience, like as soon as I got out of college, I have never had trouble getting employment. And, uh, you know, uh, half the time you have companies like Amazon, Microsoft reach out to you and, 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 and want you to come interview with them. And at the, at the certain times where you, you almost have your pick of uh, top companies to work for. So, and uh, the, the salary and compensation is pretty, it's pretty nice, mm -hmm. very nice, you know. So I, I think like, I cannot imagine any other field that is in high demand and pays that much money apart from STEM programs. Because I mean, like, I would not, I would not think like if you were to go on a program like I don't know, uh, study major in history or, or English literature. Or, yeah, like you know, the uh, the Indians yeah. are investing like one percent, like yeah, yeah. one percent that gives like one percent of those kind of programs, and uh, social science like two percent, like, yeah. Engineering STEM, as we said, it's like over seventy percent of where, yeah. where their where their focus is on. Yeah, and and I mean like that they they figured it out. You know they they figured out like that is where they need to send their their, school, their kids to. Like that's the best way they can set their, their children up for success. Um, yeah, it's it's definitely like one of those fields where like you you are you are destined to uh, um, to earn a decent living. I would say. The uh, that's that's that, that that's a that's a sorry I'm I'm being a little bit messy here. I didn't you know uh, uh, thought these things were finely organized, but it looks like uh, what you're saying. The reason why I'm bringing all the stats is because I want to like help orientate the uh, students or, or international students. They can because at times you get the uh, students say, "I go to the embassy, but I couldn't get a visa. Mm -hmm. uh, I have an admission into." Uh, social science or I have an admission into some other kind of program yeah. and you're like I had all the documents that I needed but at the embassy I still didn't I still didn't get the visa uh, and I'm beginning to think that maybe it's because of I mean I'm not I'm not a uh, uh, I don't work at a, at a consulate or whatever I'm just yeah. I'm just guessing here uh, I'm, uh, I'm trying to make an informed guess here is maybe the program you are investing in is Probably not something the belief is substantially uh, impactful in the sense of getting you go over there to study. You can study this stuff here in Cameroon, for instance. Yeah. If you are in Cameroon, you can study stuff in Nigeria. You can. Uh, now, if you're studying a STEM program, you can have a good argument because you'd be like, uh, "We don't have that sophisticated engineering kind of uh, equipment in Nigeria or in Cameroon or mm -hmm. in Ghana, for instance." That's why I want to come study in the United States because. You have the uh, resources or all the things that are probably need, but in a field like history, for instance, like I mean, you can study history in, yeah. in, where, where, wherever you're in the world, and that is translating again from the uh, the Institute of Edu of International Education. Here, yeah, you can see that the uh, the percentage, the highest number of students, international students that are registering in programs, the first year is engineering, mm -hmm. the second is smart and computer system and computer science. Uh, the third is business and management, it's MBA, the fourth social sciences, the fifth is physical and life sciences. So again, the STEM programs are taking a good chunk of, of, of that, of, of that pile. So, uh, where I'm driving at with this is if you are an international student and you're, uh, trying to figure out exactly which program you want to take, the stats are telling us that you should invest in, 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 in STEM programs. If you, if you go in university, try to look at what those programs uh, are, uh, try to figure out exactly what are some of the requirements that you need to be able to uh, get an admission into some of these universities. Because from what we're getting, those are the uh, the fields that are getting the highest pool of international students, which immediately translates to the fact that those are the ones that you are most uh, viable to get admitted for and get a visa to pursue your studies in the United States. And um, you've, we've all heard from Daniel, you don't need to know IT, for instance, before you get into an IT field. Um, that's something that I realized even back home, like uh, back 
back home in in, uh, in Cameroon, I realized like it's impossible for you to switch. Not that it's it's very hard for you to switch mm-hmm. from one field to the next. Like if you want to switch from let's say from law, you study law. If yeah. you want to switch from law to uh, do a master's, for instance, in uh, computer information or whatever, it's very difficult. But from what I'm getting uh, with you here, it's like it's actually very possible for you and very easy for you to do that switch. Yeah, it is. It is quite possible. And you know, the good thing in the US is they will let let you pick. Uh, uh, you can switch your major, and they will let you pick um, um, whichever major you want to study. You mm-hmm. want to go in. Um, the caveat being like I know like certain programs like nursing like they have yeah. certain different like uh, restrictions are put in place um, um, for you to get in but uh, on the general consensus like you can pretty much pick uh, any uh, any major mm-hmm. um, but you know like for me you know based on this the start speaks for itself you mm-hmm. know like um, it the, the STEM programs are definitely where uh, your best investment is uh, as an international student I know you did mention if what you pick, decide to study, plays an influence in if you get the visa or not. And for me, I, I don't think it necessarily does. Maybe okay. to some to an extent, maybe because like pretty much every they, uh, we have universities back home that offer STEM programs, right? Yeah, sure. Like offer computer science programs and, and, and engineering. And engineering. Yeah. Um, I think what what it ultimately comes down to is how prepared you are plus luck. Because from my experience, like when I was at the embassy. Um, there was a lady that uh, went ahead of me and the interviewer just asked her what are your names and she couldn't give a proper answer oh she was she was, she was very freaking. tense she was scared <laughs> and you know like when you're doing your tense you're scared it makes you forget yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, why are you going to study this you know what is your plan like basic questions like oh how do you plan to get there and like, there were people who genuinely could not answer so uh, for, if I if I if if I were to give an advice, it's like, please do your research before you go to the U.S. embassy. Mm-hmm. If you're going to get an international student visa, go online, watch YouTube videos, read articles about like the type of. I'm not saying like you should uh, memorize the answers, yeah, but you should be able to know the different type of questions mm-hmm. that can come up mm-hmm. and how to structure your answer. Mm-hmm. Like you you know how you should be able to look the interviewer in the eye mm-hmm. and tell them the answer. What is your name? Mm-hmm. Look them in the eye, tell them your name. Where are you going to study? Look them in the eye, tell them. How do you plan to get there? Well, I'm going to take a plane and it's going to land in Minnesota. And then from there, I'm going to take a bus up to my college. You need to know all these things. Mm-hmm. So who who's sponsoring you? Mm-hmm. This, what do they do for a living? Mm-hmm. So you have to have these answers. You have to know the ins and outs of your travel. Mm-hmm. You have to know the ins and outs of your program. Mm-hmm. Yes, one of the questions that I I, 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 I I figured out through my research before I went to the embassy is apparently they can ask you, if you've ever been in touch with any of the professors in your in your given program. So I had, because I had done research, uh, I was able to contact a professor uh, at the computer science program prior to going to the interview. And I just asked him like, hey, you know, I'm an international student, uh, potential international students. I want to come into this program and study this program. Um, what are some of like uh, advice you can give me in terms of like preparing to come? Mm-hmm. Um, starting this program and what are the things like to watch out for and what are like the resources that is available to me and he replied back to me and like he provided all the information so like when i was at the embassy they asked me well like yeah. have you mm-hmm. been in contact with any professor i was able to say yes and give the professor's name and those are information they can verify on the spot yeah sure so it's like if you don't prepare well you don't know what to expect you're gonna be scared yeah. you're gonna panic <laughs> to yeah. our viewers to our viewers <laughs> if you want us to create a series of videos on uh on how, on like some of these questions and answers, like as an international student, what are some of the things you can be expecting to get at the embassy? Uh, the Of course, the uh, consulate has the uh, discretion of whether it gives you a visa or not, but you just have to be prepared and know like some of these uh, tips and some of these tricks. So if you want us to get into a kind of a short series of bringing out some of those kind of videos, like a little bit what uh, some of the things you can be expecting, at the uh, an interview, for instance, let's get those comments right down in the comment section. Give us your thoughts, and we'll see how to get those going. Um, we have amazing people. Uh, Dan is just one of uh, the great uh, international student body that we are, I, I I know uh, in the uh, in the United States here. So there's like quite a couple of persons. Uh, I wanted actually to show this video with another international student. Yeah. who just got an internship at uh, Goldman Sachs, very good friend of mine. 
Uh, he came to the United States studying theology. Mm-hmm. Uh, got graduated with a master's in theology at the School of Divinity, I think, at Boston College. Decided to switch and do an MBA. And now he got an internship at uh, Goldman Sachs. And it's, the future is looking very bright for him. Like Goldman Sachs is not, it's not a small uh, uh, financial institution. So the uh, uh, the possibilities are just, they are just, uh, they are just uh, immense out, out, out there. And then we, uh, again, want to switch gear a little bit now and talk about your heart. You're putting on uh, uh, Chat Noir, I, I think. Mode Noir. Oh, Mode Noir. Yeah. Uh, Mode Noir. I was like looking at the card and I was looking at the black heart. Yeah. I was like, uh, what's the, uh, you're an entrepreneur as well. Yes, And you, you're a big fan of like fashion and, 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 and things like that. Yeah. Uh, when did you, when did you get that, um, that entrepreneurial uh, inclination. I would like during your studies as an international student, uh, they decided to kick something like that up, uh, or you finish a program and were like, I've always had this feeling and I wanted to explore. Maybe it's the time to do it. Tell us a little bit about uh, Monoa. Yeah, so Monoa started uh, in uh, my uh, room, that in in, the, in my room in college. In college, so yeah. I I was in. In my, in my room with my buddy and like we were, we were studying and he sort of like we sort of like started discussing about like fashion and like clothing and like yes, he was online shopping and we said oh and i told him like hey wouldn't it be cool if like we did our own uh t-shirt brand like you know sell some t-shirt and we're like, he was like oh yeah sure let's do it <laughs> and it, it, it sort of started like very um like like a joke almost so like uh from there on like we started we we created an instagram page we did a few uh, print print out t-shirts. Uh, we did a, like a, a very amateur like photo shoot uh, <laughs> with that, um, and uh, it, it just started from there on campus. Uh, and then we sold like quite a few uh, t-shirts uh, to like uh, students on campus, and uh, we just sort of like said, "Oh, you know, this is this is going well." Like you know, like it started from like a joke, but it is, it is going well. So like we decided to put more uh, more more time into it. Uh, we created the website. Um, we, uh, you know, started like expanding because we just started with just t-shirts, mm-hmm. and then uh, we started making like crop tops, uh, uh, jackets, and hats. Mm-hmm. So basically, just like uh, mostly streetwear uh, and accessories. Okay. Yeah. And how is the uh, industry? How is that? I don't know anything about like the clothing. I mean, I I kind yeah. of know because I am like in a suit thing myself. But, yeah. Uh, I don't know anything uh, about like streetwear and, and, and stuff like that. How does that industry actually function? It is, it is, it, it doesn't function differently from like any regular clothing brand. Mm-hmm. But the thing is, you have lots of competition because like there's there's yeah, sure. there's I'm there's a lot of options out there. Like um, if someone if you wanted to buy a t-shirt, like you would be spoiled for choices, right? <laughs> so um, for us, it was very important to sort of like craft our own uh, market. In between that, so we we mostly strive for uh, providing like quality at an affordable price. Okay. Because we know like most uh, t-shirt brands, like uh, the famous one or even the upcoming ones, they're they're very pricey. Yeah, sure. And but we want to provide the same quality at an affordable price. Mm-hmm. And we've been so far, we've been very successful. We've been able to like uh, grow grow the business from like literally no customer to right now we're averaging about uh, ten to fifteen customers uh, every month. Now, I know that that looks small, but like it's so for, 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 for a small brand. business, for, yeah, it, it is it is really good for it. And you no, know, it's it's more of like continually like putting in the resources, the time uh, to to build it. So that's that's just that's just that's about Mono and like uh we're planning quite a few um releases this uh upcoming summer and fall. Um, you know, if you go on our website, we like you will be able to see like some of the amazing designs that we have on there. Like we have everything for everyone. Like we have crop tops. What was the you have an Instagram page, right? Yeah, we have an Instagram I mean, like, page. Let's give that to the viewers. Yeah, so our can... Instagram page is mode underscore noir mm-hmm. and our website is uh we Okay. Yeah. We we will stick give the uh, comment right down in yeah. the uh, in the comment section so you can like visit the uh the, the website and if you're a streetwear guy if you want to offer a, a gift to someone the street where kind of line you can you can visit the uh, the uh, uh, their website and, and and check that out uh, this is closing us like to the uh, uh, final section of the of, of, of the show where I usually like to ask the guest on uh, some piece of tips of advice on 
on an international on 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 a specific on a specific uh topic generally what's the advice you've you've been remember the uh, goal of the unpaved part talk is to uh, avoid mistakes like we're trying to make sure that if you were in a specific field and you're still learning your way in there there are people who've done the same thing they're trying to do now and they've made mistakes and things like that and we want to use this platform to just serve you that knowledge and you can cut your learning time by a significant amount of time so that you don't have to repeat the same mistakes that did. So that's the that's that's where I'm going to with this, and that's what I'm going to ask uh, uh, Dan right now in the sense of uh, international students. What if you were to uh, redo your your stay as yeah. an international student today? What are some of the things you would do that you didn't do uh, back in the day? Um, that's a that's a good question because um. If I look back at it, I would say um, definitely always, always look at opportunities in which you can save yourself some costs. Okay. So in, as an international student, there's a lot of um, uh, scholarship uh, available. Mm -hmm. So I know sometimes like as an inter like for me, from my experience, I had to work on, I had an on-campus job, yeah, sure. right? So I had to uh, balance having a job and on-campus, having a job and on-campus job uh, going uh, keeping up with studies and then juggling a business on the side right so like it was uh it was it was one of those things where like i would say you definitely like should leverage opportunities for scholarship like if you can go in there and focus on your studies focus to be the best because you're competing against other people who don't have to have an on-campus job they just have to show up to class and study mm -hmm. so make sure like you know you take you take your classes seriously make sure like you know you strive to get those scholarship opportunities because like you can save yourself a whole semester of tuition if you get a scholarship mm -hmm. so always like leverage those opportunities and also make sure that you are looking for opportunities for internships okay internships are very very important because for me i had an internship at health partners where i was a web development intern and that helped me a lot in like getting like a first hand experience of what it's like to to work in my field. Mm -hmm. Like if it, if it's because internships are good. Like maybe that feel like the job and the stress in that field is not something you want to deal with. But that like internship sort of like give you a taste of that, and it helps build your your resume and build uh um your skill set. So I would say like always look for opportunities in which you can intern. And uh, it, most if you if you choose to go to into the STEM field, um, there is several resources out there that teach you how to code or uh, or whatever technical skill technical field you choose to go in so for example i'm going to speak on the on the side of a software engineer for example um there are free resources out there like w3 schools that can teach you like um several coding languages um there is like a uh, lead code where you can be able to like uh, solve uh, questions that are as in uh, software engineering interviews because believe it or not it's actually very difficult to get a job as a software engineer so you have to go somewhat of like four rounds of interview and then before you get selected. And some of these rounds involve technical questions where you're solving algorithms and puzzles. So resources like Lead Code start doing that while you're in college because like it kind of builds up your problem solving skills and you most of you, you you start getting a basic understanding of like how to solve problems in a short amount of time. Because like when you go for a coding interview, they give you an hour to solve three complex problems. Right. So like you need to be able to like uh, read and understand a problem and come up with a solution uh, um, in a very small amount of time. So, like, mm -hmm. those resources definitely helps you, like, uh, get up to speed. Mm -hmm. So, definitely always le leverage, like, internship opportunities, opportunities for you to get scholarship, and opportunities for you to learn outside of your field. Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> what other way is, can, we, uh, can we end the show apart from um, just, like, thanking you? Uh, guys, this is this is the goal of the uh, on paper talk. We are going to switch in, stay tuned to uh, some of the updates we're going to bring into the show. But I really do appreciate Danny for taking out the time to come share with us, to come talk about international students. He's broken the code. If you want to pick a crash program, you can do it. If you want to go to college, you can do it. He's given us all the resources we need. He's explained the whole process. No longer need to fall into scams of having people get into the way uh, being some kind of middleman between you and the university you want to go to. International students are highly, highly welcome in the United States. Uh, we have the stats to prove that. We have um, all the information that you can need. Or you can just go on the internet, you go to university you want to pick. 
you can get all the resources from there. You can go directly in contact with the university and start the whole process yourself. And uh, as I said, if you want us to get on some of those video series on what are some of the tip interview questions you can have as an international student at the embassy to help you in the process of getting a visa, we can equally get into that. If we want those comments below as well. And I will say thank you for watching. Thank you for staying connected throughout this series. And uh, don't forget, like, share, comment. That's going to help uh, like-minded individuals equally get to see our, 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 our episodes each time we upload them. And see you on the next one. Thank you.